<sighs> My fellow citizens and friends, I am delighted to have this opportunity to be with you today. <laughs> I must say, when I was uh, leaving the executive residence, my uh, secretary came up to me and he said, Mr. President, you realize that Secretary of War Stanton thinks you're a blame fool for going out there just now. I said, well, hey, if Stanton thinks I'm a fool, I reckon I must be one. He knows more about those things than I do. <laughs> but I am delighted to be here. I must say, my friends, in the midst of unprecedented political difficulties, we do have cause this day to give thanks to the Almighty who has instilled in us the will, the determination, and the fortitude to carry on in the midst of an unprecedented civil war. My friends, I believe that we of this Congress, this administration, this generation, are going to be remembered in spite of ourselves. There's no personal significance or insignificance that is going to spare any one or other of us. War is a terrible thing. Any crisis, whether got up by designing politicians or a real crisis, can change the entire temper of our time. But war stirs up passion. Sincerity is questioned. Hot blood grows even hotter and is now spilling. All confidence dies. Suspicion reigns. Even the best war is a terrible thing. And I think this particular war of ours is one of the most terrible. It has destroyed businesses in many families. It has disturbed business in every single, not, excuse me, not families, in every city. And it disturbed businesses in almost every city. It has separated families. It has destroyed property. It has created a national debt of unprecedented proportions. It has brought mourning to nearly every home until it could literally be said that the heavens are hung in black. Now, my friends, it's with feelings of great diffidence that I meet with you today. I realize that in times like the present, one should not utter anything for which he is not willing to be responsible in time and eternity. And I have no misapprehension that I have been invited here without regard to politics or party. I do not understand that I am standing before you because of any personal qualities of my own, but simply because I represent the majesty of this great nation at this time. My friends, I think it's true, and I can say this without any mock modesty, that I am probably the humblest individual to have ever been elevated to the office of the presidency. But that being said, I think I have been imbued with a more difficult dilemma than any president that preceded me. No one ever expected me to be president. I've been called unqualified, uncouth, unprepared, uneducated, unlovely, all of which are probably true. Well, not uneducated. I had a year of schooling, formal schooling. What little advance I got on that great store of education, I simply had to pick up on my own from time to time. We used to call that being self-made. But you know, I mentioned that in the Republican convention in Illinois. <laughs> a fellow come up to me afterward, he said, 
Did I hear you saying thou you was a self-made man? I said, well, sir, what there is in me is pretty well self-made. He said, well, I think you did a poor job of it. And he says, I wouldn't vote for you if, if you were St. Peter himself. I looked at him. I said, well, my friend, if I were St. Peter, you probably wouldn't be in my district anyway. <laughs> but my friends, humble though I may be, I am a living witness that in this country, any one of your children could look to fill that office just, just like my own poor father's child has. But I'll tell you one thing. The presidency, even to the most experienced politician, is no better roses. If I would even try to read, much less answer all of the attacks that come upon me, my office in Washington would have to be closed for any other business. Even my lifelong friend, Senator Douglas, took to calling me a two-faced man in public. Well, I'll leave that to my audience. If I had another face, you think I'd wear this one? <laughs> and so far as being president goes, you know, my friends, sometimes I feel like the, the fella who got tarred and feathered and run out of town on a rail. There's a fella that asked in Maori like that. He said, well, if it weren't for the honor of the thing, I think I'd rather walk. <laughs> Oh, I have endured a great deal of ridicule. Not entirely with, with malice. Yeah. I've also received a great deal of kindness as well. Not entirely free from ridicule. <laughs> but I am very sure that if I do not go away from here, a better man, I certainly will, a wiser one, from having learned in this office what a very poor sort of man I am. You know, my friends, if we could all just know where we are and whither we appear to be tending, I think we could all better judge what to do and how to do it. Tomorrow we celebrate the glorious fourth There's more to it than just fizzle gigs and fireworks. It was on the fourth day of July in the year 1776 when the people of a few feeble, oppressed colonies of Great Britain inhabiting only a portion of the Atlantic coast of North America publicly declared their national independence and made their appeal not only to the justice of their cause, but to the God of battles for the maintenance of that declaration. That people were few in number, entirely without resources. And yet, we have become a mighty nation. We have grown in numbers, wealth, power, as no other nation has ever grown. We have become a great empire. They tell us such a race of prosperity has been run nowhere else. That we have the best form of government the world ever knew. My friends, of our political revolution of 76, we can all be justly proud. It has given us a degree of liberty and prosperity far exceeding that of any other nation on the earth. Now, if we were to turn back the pages of history in those days, we would find a race of men then living whom we claim as our fathers and grandfathers, great-grandfathers. But you know, they were iron men. They fought for the principle that they were contending for. Their all was staked upon it. Their destinies were inseparably linked with it. 
They were a fortress of strength. They were the very pillars of the temple of liberty. But my friends, what invaders and foes could never do, the silent artillery of time has done. They've all died. And now that they have crumbled away, that temple must also fall unless we, their descendants, supply those places with other pillars. They had a task to perform, and nobly they performed it, to uprear on these hills and valleys a political edifice of civil and religious liberty, equal rights. But there remains a task for us as well to transmit these multiplied blessings, unprofaned by the foot of invaders, undecayed by the lapse of time, untorn by even the subtlest of tyrannies or, or political usurpation. My friends, I think gratitude to our fathers, a love for our species in general, a sense of duty to our own posterity ought to instill in us a moral imperative to faithfully execute our task. But how? How, how should we perform it? At what point might we expect the approach of danger? Why even suppose any danger to our institutions? Have we not been able to perpetuate them thus far? Well, first of all, to conclude that no danger may ever arise would in itself be extremely dangerous. And my friends, there are now. There will hereafter continue to be many causes very dangerous in their tendency which have not even existed heretofore and which merit our attention. So, at what point do we, in fact, expect the approach of danger? My answer is, if it ever reaches, it will first spring up amongst us. The duty of self-preservation, self-preservation rests solely with us, the American people. Oh, my friends, I think we have an ever-growing interest in maintaining the free institutions of this country. I am exceedingly anxious that this union, our constitution, the very liberties of this people will be perpetuated in accordance with the original idea for which that struggle was made. Now we know that when that struggle was made in the American Revolutionary War, some terrible sacrifices were made by the men engaged in it. I remember when I was a boy, I got hold of a, a little book, probably such a one as none of you have ever even laid eyes upon. It was called Parson Williams' Life of General George Washington. And I remember reading in that book of, of the danger that those people incurred simply by assembling as we are today when they framed and adopted the Declaration of Independence and the, and the terrible struggles they endured in order to secure that independence. And I remember thinking then, and I was just a boy, there must have been something, something more than common that those men struggled for. Something more than just national independence. Because by what they then did, it has followed that the degree of prosperity and liberty which we now enjoy has come to us. And so, my friends, ought we not to inquire what it is that has given us so much liberty and prosperity? Because to lose that would be to lose it all. It's not our frowning battlements, our bristling sea coasts. It is not the guns of our war steamers. It is not the, the, the strength of our gallant and disciplined military. 
all of those elements can be turned against any people without making the people themselves any weaker for the struggle. My friends, our reliance is in the love of liberty, which God, the love of liberty, which God Almighty has planted in our bosoms. In our defense is in the spirit which prizes that liberty as the heritage of all men, of every race and every color. My friends, that spirit was instilled in us by God Almighty. But I fear that we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which conceived us in liberty, which multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. We vainly imagine in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all of these blessings are produced by some superior wisdom or virtue of our own. We have become intoxicated with our unbroken success, too self-sufficient to pray to the God that made us. My friends, our common country is in great peril. I am surrounded, as is the whole country, by very trying circumstances. And I, th it is, I think it is peculiarly fit for us at this time to recognize the hand of God in this. You know, the good old maxims of the Bible are very and truly applicable to human affairs. All the good the Savior gave to this world is communicated to us through that book. I think it's the best gift God has given to man. But for it, we wouldn't know the difference between right and wrong. And you see, that's the real issue. That is the issue that will continue in this country long after these poor tongues will be silenced forever. It will remain this great eternal struggle between the two principles of right and wrong throughout the world. Those are the, the two principles that have stood face to face ever since the beginning of time and will ever continue to struggle. Every little shifting of the political scene or, or the actors thereon only clears away all the intervening trash, compacts, consolidates the opposing forces, and brings them more and more distinctly face to face. So, my friends, they say, and it has been said in this world's history hitherto, that might makes right. But I believe it is for us and for our time to reverse that maxim and to say that right makes might. The Lord is always on the side of the right, and it is my constant prayer and anxiety that I and this nation shall be found on the Lord's side. It is for this reason that I, Abraham Lincoln, 16th President of these United States, do earnestly recommend to all the people, to my fellow citizens, that we unite 
that you unite with me as, as the chief magistrate of this nation with all loyal, law-abiding citizens and reverently humble ourselves in the dust and from thence to offer up fervent prayers to the God of nations in whose hands are the destinies of everyone. We must implore his compassion and forgiveness. We must implore him not to destroy us as a people or suffer us to be destroyed by the hostility or connivance of other nations or by obstinate adherence to our own human counsel. We must implore him to lead this nation through the paths of repentance, to enlighten the mind of this nation to know and to do his will, humbly believing that our place here on earth should be maintained as a united people among the family of nations. My friends, if we do not do right, I believe that he will let us go our own way to ruin. But if we do right, I believe he will lead us safely out of this wilderness. I will admit that our Republican robe has become soiled and trailed in the dust. Let us repurify it. Let us turn and wash it white in the full conviction that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. Let us remember the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scripture and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. And then, having, having chosen our course without any guile, but with pure purpose, let us renew our trust in God and go forward with manly hearts, with, with malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. My friends, it will be worthy our every effort. Thank you.